It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, the human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. Happy 2020. New decade seems to be the flavor. A lot of changes these days in between decades. Uh, Three decades ago, there was no internet in any form. 1990 was when computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. Eight years from then, Google was created. Six years from that date was when Facebook was founded. So that's only in three decades. Um, A lot of changes in between decades. There is no point playing down my next guest because not only did one of his companies produce shows like The Tim Ferriss Show and Reid Hoffman's Masters of Scale, his other company, which is why I'm interviewing him, is called Ladder, wearladder.com. And his co-founders include LeBron James, Cindy Crawford, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Lindsey Vaughn. And here's the kicker. He is one of the nicest people you'll meet. Developing a wellness brand alongside one of the highest paid athletes in the world is kind of cool. Funny enough, I decided to Google highest paid athletes and on the Forbes link, which is the first link on Google, LeBron's image pops up first. He is, however, the fourth highest paid athlete at a whopping $680 million for 2019. For your information, Floyd Mayweather tops that list at $915 million. So, Adam, what was the first phone call like? You know, the one on which Ladder was founded. First phone call is like getting a call from Arnold and his team being like, I need you to come to my office for a meeting. No context. And like when Arnold wants you to come to a meeting, you just show up to a meeting. And the meeting was with Mike Mencius, LeBron's trainer. And it was essentially like, hey, LeBron wants to take a supplement, has never taken a supplement. I can't find, this is Mike saying, I can't find anything out there that is good. Will you help us create a supplement for LeBron? You got to sign an NDA. We're not going to tell anyone. This is just like, help me create a better supplement for LeBron. And that's it. And I'm like, you know what? Hell yes. Yeah. Where do I sign up? This is like great opportunity. It wasn't, it wasn't even something I could tell anyone about at the time. So this is like, this is years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, on today's volume of the psychology of entrepreneurship, I am going inside the mind of a performer, someone that performs regularly, just like every one of us. He performs as a father, husband, brother, friend, creator, speaker, nutritionist, athlete, entrepreneur, leader, and the list goes on. Could we potentially bundle it? Adam, what's the impact you want to leave on people? What's the impact you want to leave on people? And for me, it's like, I want to leave people better than I found them. And it's very cliche to say, but for me, it's just like, it's as, it's as small. And, and my best friends know this probably like, if I'm out to eat at a restaurant and our server, you can just tell is like mailing in and having a bad day. It will be my obsessive focus to like make them smile and make them feel good by the time we're done. And hopefully you can just do it by just being kind or asking about them or like just taking a moment on them. Yeah. Um, the, the cheap trick is if like they're still not having it, you just give them a big tip at the end of the, the meal. And it's just like something that's so small and trivial, it's money, but can make people realize that oh, they were paying attention because I usually leave a note on their seat saying something like, hopefully this like lifts your spirits or hope you end up having a better day from here on out. Like you can just, so it's like if, if my moral compass is to leave people better than you found them, um, that can be a part of a business and the environment and ecosystem and culture you try to create, but it's really more about, it's a gut check for yourself. And of each day, just asking yourself, like, 
did you do a good job of treating people well? Because I think those things make a difference. I would say those things are what, uh, in a funny way, created a lot of opportunity for me in a business standpoint was just trying to be a, a good human and doing things that I, I don't think I deserve praise for. I think it's the way that people should be. Look out, look out for others, help people out when they ask you for a favor. I, you know, I didn't do it this year, but at 212 every year, I came up with like rules. And rule number one is always like, don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. It seems like a simple rule, but I've been an asshole. And whoever is listening, thinking you are Ronsley, you are an asshole. I'd like to buy you dinner. Uh, if you are wondering what is 212, it is another business that Adam has created and is run by his brother, Jordan. I was curious, talking with Adam, whether he felt the need to tell people that he was working with the likes of LeBron and Arnold, because I suppose there would have been some non-disclosure agreements to be signed in a few different forms. What does that do if people think that I helped create something for LeBron, for the people that matter? Nothing. Like the people who know me, the people who like me, and like, what does it really do? Is like, if I, I just, I'm so adamant that, you know, the type of things that allowed me to get an opportunity with LeBron or with Arnold, and this all came through Arnold because I did work for Arnold for 10 years without ever asking for anything. It was just like, I saw it as an opportunity to truly do great work. And out of that, I can't tell you how many book opportunities or ghostwriting. And it's just like, you know, I didn't like make money. We had like a partnership type of program where it's just like, I wanted to do great work for him, but I made money because I, I had opportunity and I just did great work. I didn't allow the ego to be in like, well, I'm a big deal. I'm a, oh, you want me to write a book for your friends? I'm a New York times bestselling author. Like look where that would have got me. Look how many times that if I allowed like me to focus on who got to know about what I did, like people didn't even know that I worked with Arnold for years, for years, because I didn't care. You know what I cared about? I cared that like Arnold was happy with the stuff that I did for him because that's what mattered. And in this situation, I cared that like, man, LeBron's trainer is trusting me to help create supplement for the best basketball player in the world. Where is my priority on like getting a pat on the back or on fulfilling that job? And I truly believe this is again, like leave people better than you found them. I'm not leaving LeBron or Mike better off if I'm focusing on like how this can make me look better. The author of The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle, describes one's ego as being very vulnerable and insecure, seeing itself as constantly being under threat. This, by the way, is the case even if the ego is outwardly very confident. Oh yeah, Adam is also a New York Times best-selling author. So, easy to get self-important when you start to juggle the opportunities. Also, It's easy to get carried away with saying yes to everything. Adam, however, is most definitely a self-aware human. I think, not I think, I know that I am a very vulnerable person in general, extremely comfortable with being emotional and having emotions. But I hate talking about myself and what I do. I mean, by nature, our our consulting agency was pen name. So the idea is like, it's like a ghostwriter. We're the the ghost machine. We're in the background. The idea is do great work. People are happy. It was the same thing with the fitness business. Kind of the same way. I mean, if you, and you could see how the guy who runs 212, my brother Jordan operates, it's like put on a great event and let the people make the event. It's not about Jordan. It's definitely not about me. But I think... Uh, it was one of those moments where in that event in particular, it's about the connection and the best way you connect with people, uh, is to be yourself and and be real. And the past year was in particular a difficult one. And in that moment, I couldn't ask people to be open and vulnerable without leading by example. And that, that was, it was just one of those things that, that came out that, if you sit and talk with me one-on-one, I'm an open book, but getting up and just talking about myself in front of a group of people just isn't how I typically operate. I don't feel or find myself self-important enough that I need to discuss those things. 
but I, I felt that it was, it was the right place and the right time to, to open up like that. While we were talking about all this, it reminded me of Dr. Sherry Walling in volume two talking about loneliness because the need to be self-important is probably amplified by the same thing that causes loneliness. So, you know, this might seem like a far step from entrepreneurs who are fully grown, but like at one point, all of us are formed by our relationships with other people. And I think that we are really kind of in a crisis of loneliness I'm, and I'm not alone in that opinion. Um, it, I think, is also amplified by things like social media that have the the feeling of relatedness, but aren't. And when we are alone in our own thoughts and our own feelings, and then we see this sort of like relational porn of, oh my God, all these people are gathered in Mexico on this great retreat. I, why am I not there? They didn't invite me. And while I remember Cherry, I also remember Jason Gaynard in volume nine talking about this insane statistic. Like I remember there was a book called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. He wrote another book called Who's Got Your Back? And in that book, he interviewed a thousand people at random and he asked the, the people one question, one question only, who has your back? Yeah. Surprisingly, 55% of people felt like nobody had their back. Even more surprisingly, 60% of those people were married. So that's a problem. Like I, I think that at our core, we need to at least find a few people where we believe they have our back. That if, you know, stuff hit the fan, we could sleep on their couch for a couple yeah. of nights or whatever the case may be. Like I could not imagine navigating the world feeling that isolated, feeling that alone. While Adam and I were talking about self-importance and the meaning of life, I told him about the time I was late for my first meeting with Gary Vaynerchuk at Hudson Yards in New York. No one ever prepares you for New York traffic. I was late and paralyzed in the car, feeling like a player that has worked so hard for the right opportunity. And when it came along, I was choking. I, for a brief moment, had a thought playing on repeat inside my head. Ronsley, this is how you choke. And then Adam launched into one of the most beautiful rants about choking and muscle memory. Choking can be looked from uh, a bunch of different angles because sometimes you do everything right and you still fail or you still don't succeed the way that you want. And I don't consider that choking. I think choking is when you do something that should be routine and you let the situation or the circumstances change how you would approach things. So even giving your situation, I'm sure you've been in very, very stressful situations before. Mm -hmm. Things that challenged you mentally or physically or your business or it allow you to even question what you did. And there's probably sometimes the self-talk isn't like, this is how you choke. This is like, no, this is how I'm going to turn this around. Or I got this. Or man, how many blocks away am I? Can I, go, can I run there? Can I get this? There's a mindset that we are that you almost train yourself that becomes your routine. And when you're in a situation of what they call like performance or something that's literally known as the arousal anxiety curve, because you want a little bit of anxiety and arousal to perform at your best. But if you get a, too much of one of them, that's where you, you drop off on performance. Um, it's, it's okay to have nerves. I actually think like you're not human if you don't have nerves. It's a, it's a good thing to like get that pit in your stomach and it, it causes you to level up. But if you find yourself in a situation you've been in before, and the circumstances can be different, but it's essentially the same thing. You've got a big meeting. There's, you know, the example in, in, in football, American football is, is kicking. You're like, you're kicking a ball. Like kickers, I mean, they literally, it's, they, they just, they get the pattern down. So it's, it's so repetitive. Like it should be, right. It should be the exact same thing. And we're not talking about it's windy or it's a 50 yard kick or the line broke down and they blocked it. Like there's so many variables that are outside, but it's like, what's happening in that moment? Are you just being as cool? Complicated. Are you being you? And I consider choking the moment when you stop being yourself. And that's the funny part. Like there's nothing wrong with failing. There's something wrong with like not sticking to what got you there, not being yourself, because that's when things get off. Like it's so easy to throw off one variable. People talk about the domino effect. Like the reason why we practice things, the reason why we do things, the reason we do them over and over and over again in life is to prepare this for the situation when it comes up, just follow what you did because the likelihood of your output being the same, even if you feel like there's a million things different, they're not. It's the exact same. You were 
You were built for this moment. We are all built for this moment, but sometimes, and it happens to every single person, we make the moment bigger than ourselves and we start thinking differently or we start acting differently or again, again, that like anxiety gets a little too hard. So we start perspiring a little bit much or, or it even happens earlier than that. We start freaking ourselves out the day before and we don't sleep as well. Like there's research out, the brand new one trying because like you were talking about the hustle point, like it was looking at like entrepreneurs and their decision making. And people wore this badge of honor, like I stood it up all night and their ability to, and this was research, their ability to identify a good idea was significantly lessened when they had a bad night of sleep versus a good night of sleep. Same person, really intelligent, but like you can imagine how this plays out. You have a big meeting, you stay up all night obsessing over it. Whereas if you've done everything right, all the work is done prior. When you have a big meeting, it's not like cramming an hour before isn't going to make a difference. It's like, what have you done for the last five years? This is volume 17. And I've been on this mission now for over a year from when the first interviews were done. And it all comes down to what are the things you are doing regularly? What are the reps? For me, it wasn't about the reps though. I had the reps in spades. It was about recognizing the reps for myself acknowledging and feeling the successes and the failures of those reps. I think maybe to protect myself from not feeling the failures, I might have blocked feeling the successes too. For the longest time, I hated that I didn't do better. But we are all figuring it out together, I suppose. You know, there's a kind of famous study from maybe years back where they kind of looked at all the different type of copy that will get people to react strongest. Right. And, and it's funny, like if it's, if there's like, you'd have the best copy in the world. And if you like put it against imagery of like half naked women, the naked women outperform everything, <laughs> there's certain, certain rules. I mean, there's, I don't know, a lot of, a lot of ridiculous men out there, but with the copy, the copy that made the biggest response that would get open rates, clicks reaction is you are not alone. And when people use that on headlines and the open line of copy, it performs repeatedly over and over and over again, no matter how cliche or ridiculous, because most people feel in their head, in their minds, that they are alone, that the things that they struggle with, the, the doubts that they have, it's just like, it's them. Like everyone else has got it figured out and no one does. No one's got to figure out. We're all figuring it out together. When we come back, cheeseburgers and orgasms but also the best diet to follow. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values in a place where conversation can be had without judgment. A place where our listeners can give us constructive feedback to improve this show with topic and guest recommendations. For access to full-length interviews and access to that place, go to mustamplify.com slash POE and click the button. Before the break, self-importance and choking in important moments. Now I wanted to get into the nutrition side of things because the psychology of food and nutrition is an obvious one. One where I've had hundreds of conversations about on the Bond Appetit podcast. Eric Barker, who's a writer, writes a, has a great like email that's like barking up the wrong tree, like uh, turns science and uh, understandable stuff. Years ago, I remember him saying there was a study that, that essentially showed that uh, when you eat, you know, it lights up sections of your brain. And when you would have two cheeseburgers, it lit up areas of your brain in the same way as an orgasm. Wow. And then people wonder why like food is so addicting. And it's because like from a, a chemical standpoint, like it's not the same, but it's similar. Like you things are lighting up in your brain and it feels good. And you just want to repeat that. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like orgasms. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's very, very easy to then be like, I like cheeseburgers. 
I suppose one of my fundamental learnings from all the interviews I did with people around food was that the companies making the food we buy at the supermarket are spending lots of money on research and development to make sure cheeseburgers give you orgasms. There are different types of barriers for us to eat well, though, especially psychological barriers. The psychological barriers are bigger than the, uh, than the physiological ones. So there are so many things, even from a fat loss standpoint, that could be affecting you that people don't even realize. Stress, without a doubt, can affect the way that your body will process and, and burn fat. The, the even awareness of there's a big difference between eating healthily and eating for fat loss. So you can be eating perfectly healthy foods and you can still gain weight if you're eating too many of them or if there's a break in the system. Sleep deprivation destroys your ability to lose weight. Anything less than six hours, it's kryptonite for fat loss. People don't even realize it, how bad it is from like every single major hormone that is impacted by fat loss is negatively affected if you don't sleep enough. Um, diet extremes, like having to remove all sugar or greens. And some people will need to do that because habitually it's a problem. But unless you have an allergy, no one needs to remove these things. Even, even sugar, people don't realize like fruits and vegetables have a good amount of sugar in them. They don't realize that like our bodies, our internal wiring is designed to run on sugar. There's a process known as gluconeogenesis where if you are eating either a fat or a protein, if your body is devoid of carbohydrates, doesn't have any, your body will turn the, the fat or the protein into carbohydrates, into sugar so that your brain and your body can use it. So like we freak out about sugar. Now added sugars are having too much sugar without a doubt is bad because of the stress that it can put on your system in the way that it can easily turn into fat. But the idea of like any one thing is so bad, it's ridiculous or even carbohydrates. You can look at the blue zones, which is the areas where people live the longest. And the blue zones, the majority of them, 70% of their diets are made of carbohydrates. You see this in, for instance, Japanese culture. People are obsessed with Japanese who live up to 10 years longer than any other culture. And yet the majority of their diet is white rice. You can't just ignore that stuff. But then we will sit here and be like, no, oh, all carbs are bad or don't eat any white foods. And I'm like, ah, it doesn't really quite add up. Okay, Adam, as someone who develops nutrition for the best athlete on the planet, what is the best diet to follow? The majority of health and fitness is a game of, I have a question, let me type it into Google. SERP1, the first page of search results, is, I mean, if you get past the first like two to three ads, you have like six results and it's probably six articles saying six different things. And I just, uh, my heart bleeds for people because that's so frustrating. Like, how do you know what to trust? As part of the reason is the direction we're going with ladder is trying to democratize access to the best experts so that you know what to believe and that like this is someone that's reputable. So what hurts me is when people take, the, take these dogmatic approaches because when it comes to diet, the hardest thing for people to accept, but it's one of the best things they can do is that many things work. We're all looking for that magic bullet. But research has gone ahead and compared like high fat, a, a low fat, high carb, low carb, moderate protein. And essentially it's found that like all of these diets can work. And what really matters is your consistency and your sustainability because the number of calories you eat in a day and the, the, the breakdown of those calories, the proteins, the carbs, the fats, will ultimately de determine like a net energy balance. No one is saying that all calories are created equal, but they are saying that calories matter. So all calories are not created equal because there's something known as, we talked about metabolism earlier, like the thermic effect of food, TEF. So every type of food is digested a little bit differently. Protein is the most metabolically active. 30% of calories from protein are burned up in your metabolism. So if you were to eat 100 calories from protein, really only 70 are hitting your body because 30% of them are burned up, whereas like, fats is somewhere in like six to eight percent carbs are like four to six percent so that's one component of it also the more muscular you are the more efficiently you burn up calories so the more muscle you you hold onto your body like when you're eating food the few of it the less of it hits your body so 
all of these fact all of these factors determine how the foods you eat will be processed. But at the end of the day, it's still like how many calories when all of it is netted out. When you factor out the amount that you burn from the protein, when you factor out the amount you burn from the amount of muscle on your body, is just like how many calories are you taking in? How many or how many are you like putting out by activity? And like you'll get a net amount. But you have all of these different variations. So the question then becomes not like should I go keto? Should I go high protein? Do I need to cut out all carbs or avoid gluten or avoid dairy or cut out sugar? But which one of these diets, if I am being true and following them the way that I should, can I follow for the longest period of time? Because researchers say that the average person will go on a diet for four weeks and then go off it for 12 weeks. So when you think about it, like you're off your diet for three times longer than you're on your diet. And it's no reason or no wonder why at the end of the year you end up worse than you started. Did you know that 90% of serotonin receptors are located in the gut? This can be valuable information when considering the connection between the brain and the gut. Since we got that nutrition advice out of the way, with all the things Adam had done, what did success look like for him? What really matters? I think there are two things that go into this. And one is kind of my own mindset and approach to life, which is that this work stuff in the grand scheme of things, it's like a game. It's not what really matters. So I can't go in with this self-important attitude because what I, I work with people or I've helped out successful businesses. At the end of the day is what really matters are the, the people who truly know you and truly care about you and what they have to say about you and how you make them feel and what you do for them. So the stuff that matters most to me, for me to say that I'm a big deal, I'll be a big deal when my, my little kids who I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old are, are all grown and they tell me that I, I did right by them or they're proud or they're happy or I made them feel good with my wife can look me in the eye and say that I did a good job as a husband. If my closest friends sit there and have nothing but good things to say about me and what I did for them and how I took care of them. That's just, it's my own value system. So part of it is just like when it comes to work stuff, because I, I don't make it my end all be all. This is, this is what I do for a living, not who I am. And I, I like to think that I'm good at what I do, but it doesn't make me better or more important than anyone else. What is your value system? I don't even necessarily know mine. Because I feel like there are ones that I care about so much, but I find that I catch myself holding back the most when it comes to those particular values. What was that about our greatest bully? We don't like ourselves. So many of us don't like ourselves. We're afraid of how humanity will judge us, but humanity will never judge us the way we judge ourselves. Mm. So we spend so much time and energy looking good on the outside, pretending we're happy on Facebook every single day. And very few of us are willing to actually look at the greatest bully that we'll ever meet, ever, that meets us in the fucking mirror every single morning of our lives. That was Philip McKernan from Volume 1. Because what holds me back is myself. It's always been. Fear. Being brave when you're scared. Actually, being brave in those instances is just being yourself. You got to be yourself. And like, this is what works for me. And this is what, like, I do think like if I would allow myself to be any other way, I think it would fundamentally change who I am. And like, that's what scares me. Like, that's what prevents me from doing it. Like, uh, I always remember like in one of Tim's interviews, he was talking with like Jamie Foxx and he asked like, what's on the other side of fear? The other side of fear, he said, was nothing. The idea being that most of us like build up these things in our head and we're like terrified it of it. But for me, on the other side of my fear is what I know are the things that can be self-destructive, the type of things that can like crack the foundation of who you are. Um, and, and I don't, I don't want to crack the foundation of being good to people, taking care of people, being driven by money, being driven by fame, being driven by who I know or what pictures I have. Like I know what I value in my life and it keeps me very, very grounded. It's almost stoic in a sense that like, I know that one day I'm not going to exist. Like one day I'm just not going to wake up. That terrifies me. That terrifies me too, Adam. But before we wrap this up, 
Any final words? I'll say this. Like one, I think a lot of the stuff I do is atypical or my mindset is atypical. And two, it's very easy to like come across as like, I don't think like this is necessarily the only way to go. There's a million ways to live your life and a million different things that you can value. Like this is my value system. And I think the worst thing you can do is take this like holier than thou, like, oh, be like me and your life will be better. Like, I don't even fucking believe that. Like a lot of people could go ahead and replicate what I do and like they would be miserable. Miserable. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. So my name is UJ and I am the co-creator of something called the five minute journal, um, which is as of date sold significantly over half a million copies. I think success is getting what you want. It's that easy and that is that complex. It's getting what you want. So I have a, I have a history of, of uh, disrespecting, I would say misplaced authority. I always knew I wanted to do something of my own. Yeah. Like the alternative just didn't work. I, I was, my parents had a shitty time with me and my teachers had a shitty time with me and every authority has had a shitty time with me. I did made a shitty decision that I have no one but me to blame and now I have to live with that for the rest of my life. It sucks. Psychology of entrepreneurship. I interviewed Adam because Adam Bonstein is a New York Times best-selling author, the founder of Pen Name Consulting and Born Fitness. He is the author of seven books, including three fitness bestsellers. His work has been featured everywhere from the New York Times and Fast Company to ESPN, the magazine, and GQ. His clients include Microsoft, Equinox, Dollar Shave Club, Beach Body, and individuals such as LeBron James, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Tim Ferriss. He is an award-winning fitness and nutrition writer and editor, the fitness advisor for Arnold Schwarzenegger and LeBron James. He is also a father, husband, and entrepreneur. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Kelly Bonniman, Joel Thomas, and Nemanja Bakovic. Voiceovers by Kelly Bonniman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Sleepers. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm a part of the team that made this production come alive. Our team consists of members from all around the globe, with our headquarters based in West End, Brisbane, Australia, the land of the drop bear. For more information about the cool stuff that we're up to and to work out of our studios, head to mustamplify.com. Are you still listening? Here's a little gift to you for sticking around. I don't even necessarily know mine. I don't even necessarily know mine. <laughs> I also remember Jason Gaynard in volume nine talking about this insane. The 90% of serotonin. The 90% of.